Okay, so uh, the next example we're going to look at is an example for an ideal transformer problem. And there's a couple things that are sort of important for ideal transformers. This comes from the linear transformer uh, theory, um, and we could do some linear transformer problems, but they're quite similar to the mutual inductance problems, to be honest. So uh, really I'm not going to focus on those at all. I'm going to uh, focus more on ideal transformers. And so let's look at an example with an ide ideal transformer. So uh, let's say we have a transformer here. And Notice it looks sort of like two uh, inductors back to back. Um, typically, you'll see these double lines here for the ideal transformer uh, setup. Um, we're going to have a relatively simple problem, and then we're going to do a, m a more advanced problem here in a minute. So we're just going to terminate this with a load impedance ZL. Um, okay, so a couple of things that are important um, are the turns ratio of this ideal transformer, which in this problem, which is problem 40 from your book, is 1 to 6, and 1 corresponds to N1, the number of turns uh, per unit length on the input side of the transformer and N2 is the number of turns per unit length on the secondary side of the ideal transformer. And so the ratio is called N2 over N1 or just A. So a lot of times you may see this written as, you know, 1 to A or maybe just A for the turns ratio. And so that, you know, if you know A, you don't necessarily need to know N1 by itself or N2 by itself. It's the, the ratio of the two that's important. Uh, the dots in this problem for the ideal transformer are this way. And I think, again, like I said, for the mutual inductance, it's good to sort of stick with the way that your book does everything. And if you do stick with everything that way, then what it, what happens is the equations will always be like they list them and you don't have to worry about minus signs or anything like that. So if it's labeled differently in your book problem that you're trying to do, then label it, relabel it as it is in the book's examples and then, you know, go from there. That way you can always keep the positive signs and not have to worry about it. Okay, so in uh, this problem, V1 is labeled here, I1 is labeled going in, V2 is labeled here, and I2 is labeled there. Now I'll point out in this particular example, the way it's done is the way that the book does it by default. Now this is a little bit different than, you know, we were talking about with mutual inductances. Um, notice that it is the same in the first instance that I'm going to talk about, and that is the pluses for both V1 and V2 are at the dots. That's the same. What's different is I1 is going into the dot, but I2 is going out of the dot. And that's just the way that your book defines the ideal transformer equations and it's important because you know you need to know how to interpret um, whether or not you need a you know negative sign in front of something and if you leave everything labeled like this where the voltages are plus to minus plus is at the dot currents going into the dotted terminal of the primary coil out of the 
dotted terminal and the secondary co uh, coil, then you can write these equations this way. N2 over N1 is A. Now that's the same always. Zn is Zl over A squared. Now that's an equation that comes from um, basically looking at the input impedance for uh, a particular um, load impedance attached to the secondary coil and that doesn't actually vary with the plus or minus sign uh, being at the dotted or undotted terminal either because it's just an impedance so that one's not one you have to worry about but what you would have to worry about are these equations and that is V2 over V1 is equal to A and I2 over I1 is equal to 1 over A. Now notice from from those two equations right there okay V2 over I2 well you can see in this example V2 is the voltage across ZL, I2 is the current through ZL so V2 over I2 is equal to ZL and if you talked about the input impedance right here then that would be V1 over I1 is equal to Zn and so um, if I take uh, V2 over I2 and I divide it by V1 over I1 notice that that is ZL over ZN but this is the same V2 over V1 Um, oops. It divided by I two over I one. Well, V two over V one is A. I2 over I1 is 1 over A. So this is equal to A squared. And notice the right hand side of that which is right here is ZL over ZN. So this is where we get the Zn is equal to Zl over A squared. That's where this formula comes from for one of the ideal transform equations. So that one's not really all that important. <clears throat> now uh, what this question is after here is, well, what is V2 and I2? and they give you a, a voltage for the V1 phaser and it's V1 is equal to 4 angle 32 degrees and they give you that ZL is 1 minus J ohms so ZL obviously if we look at it it's part resistance and part capacitance to give us that uh, real plus an imaginary part that's negative. Um, one of the things that I should point out notice it looks like V1 doesn't look like there's a source there and you can make the uh, assumption oh because it's an open circuit there 
that really there's no current, but that's not really the way they define this. Really what they're saying here is, oh, okay, I have this source here like this, and it's V1. I know that's a little confusing, but that is that is the way they often do these kinds of problems. They don't really show a voltage source over there. They just show that there's a voltage, and they are allowing current to flow. It's not just an open circuit. Okay, so in this problem, we see that if we're trying to solve for V2 and I2, well, obviously we could take ZL and bring it back to the input side, but that's really not going to help us. In other words, I'm taking, talking about taking this 1 minus J ohm from here and moving it over to Zn using our uh, Zn is equal to Zl over A squared, but all that's going to do is allow us to find I1. And that's not really what we're after. We're after for I we're after I2 and V2, so that's really not something we can do, although it's perfectly, it's a perfectly reasonable thing to do. It's not anything wrong with that. But what we want to do, since we've got everything defined like we want, we know we can use the fact that our N2 over N1, our turns ratio is 6 to 1, and we know that V2 over V1 is equal to A the turns ratio, so that's equal to that 6, since N2 over N1 is equal to A. So since we know V1, then V2 is just 6 V1, so that's equal to 6 times 4 with the angle of 32 degrees, so we get 24 angle 32. And then we can say, oh, okay, well, we want I2. We didn't have I1, so we can't use, you know, the, if we did have I1 right off the bat, we could say, oh, well, I2 over I1 is 1 over A. That's fine, but we don't know I1. We just knew V1. Now, of course, if we did move that load impedance to the input side as an input impedance, then we can find I1 and then find I2. But that's not the way uh, I think it's easiest in this problem. We can find I2 pretty easily because if we know V2, we can always write the equation minus V2 plus I2 times ZL is equal to zero, which is not anything but saying V2 is I2 ZL or that's the same as um, saying that <clears throat> I2 is V2 over ZL and if we look at that it should not be surprising to us at all since V2 is also written right there then V2 over ZL that's going this way and that is the direction of I2 so that should make sense to everyone uh, pretty easily so that means we have V2 which is 24 angle 32 degrees divided by ZL which we have as 1 minus J and so If I look at that, then calculate everything, I'll get in real and imaginary components 3.82 plus 16.5J. Uh, and then I can convert that to polar form, and that's 17 angle 77 degrees. Then let's say I wanted to know I1. Well, then I could use my I2 over I1 formula that I talked about, and that's 1 over A. 
And so that tells me that I1 is a I2. And so this is equal to 6 times, okay, we had 17 angle 77 degrees for that. So it's um, <clears throat> I guess 6 times 17 is 34, 102 angle 77 degrees so um, that's the the form we get now I may have had a little bit of a rounding error there I think uh, my rounding for the 17 angle 77 it would have been a little bit less than that 16 point something but I rounded up to 17 so that's fine um, okay, so let me just say here a couple of things about this problem that you should note about ideal transformers. Notice what happened to V2 in relation to V1. Well, V2 got six times bigger because V1 was four angle 32, V2 became 24 angle 32. What happened to I? Well, I got six times smaller. I1 was 102 angle 77, but I2 is 17 angle 77. So I2 is six times smaller than I1. V2 is six times larger than V1. What happens to the power? Well, the power is the same. And that should make sense because this ideal transformer is supposed to be ideal which means lossless so what's going on here in this particular example as is the case with these ideal problems none of the power is lost right here all of the power is in ZL and if you look at it on the input side the power lost in ZL would be the same as the power lost if I move it over here as ZN the power in ZL is the same in the power in Z, as is the same as the power in ZN. That should make sense because there's no way that the transformer is supposed to lose any power. So if it doesn't lose any power and the load impedance can basically be transferred to the input impedance, that means the input impedance is essentially only absorbing power because of what the load impedance is absorbing so you can translate back and forth um, and you know easily be able to calculate power so that's an advantage of the ideal transformer we don't have to worry about power loss within the transformer itself and we'll look at another problem where we're uh, talking about that next